Hi, my name is Beth Novak and welcome. Through these videos, we have discussed how to help entrepreneurs, public entrepreneurs that is, see creative ideas to solve public problems. In our last module on rapid evidence review, we talked about techniques for quickly scavenging for evidence and explained that one place to start is to review a list of generic approaches first to identify categories of possible solutions. But those generic approaches have changed in the 21st century. And in this module, we review both traditional and innovative types of solutions in order to expand our readiness to solve problems. First, we discuss some traditional ways in which governments can address problems. One, governments can levy taxes to raise revenue or to create a disincentive for a behavior. For example, a tax on cigarettes generates money that can be spent on the public health consequences of smoking or on something else. Raising the price also reduces the number of cigarettes people will buy. On the other hand, a tax break or deduction can encourage pro-social behavior. Many jurisdictions are considering, for example, a worker training tax credit to reverse the decade-long decline of employer expenditures on worker training and help small and mid-sized businesses overcome financial hurdles to provide training to workers. Second, governments also regulate. A public entity can create, abolish, or change a regulation. It can change the standard upon which the regulation is based, add or remove an exception to it, or increase or reduce enforcement of it. There are countless examples of government seeking to solve a problem by imposing a regulatory requirement, such as dictating maximally safe levels of a contaminant or minimally safe workplace safety conditions. Third, governments spend money, of course. In 2015, the U.S. federal government budgeted $3.84 trillion in contracts and grants. These sums provide the government with substantial instruments, such as block or competitive grants, strategies that leverage the state's role as a huge market player or sponsor of research and development that it can use to influence policy. Finally, the government, especially at the state or local level, often addresses challenges by delivering a service, such as a benefit for reduced rate housing, a subsidy for food, or a direct service like health care. Thus, public entrepreneurs can think about which new service to offer and which to abolish, how to deliver the service differently or to a different audience, how to reduce the cost or improve access to the service, or how to stimulate its uptake and use. Okay, so far so obvious. These approaches are all familiar and well-known, and if you want to read more about them, check out Eugene Bardock's A Practical Guide to Policy Analysis. But technology and data have also expanded the 21st century public entrepreneur's toolkit beyond that of legislation, regulation, grants, and tax breaks. For the remainder of this module, we will share some of these new tools that you should also consider if, as White House veteran Tom Khalil likes to say, you want to enhance your policy readiness. In the digital age, obviously, governments can and do create and improve websites or other digital tools. These can make service provision more convenient or make information more readily available. For example, New Jersey's Department of Labor and Workforce Development is building a so-called smart disclosure tool to allow job seekers to compare training opportunities and outcomes. Long before the department had mandated that training providers submit data about the tr contents of their programs, but that information sat in the drawer. By combining these data with IRS income data showing income improvements obtained by those people who took a program, the department hopes now to be able to show prospective students which programs are more likely to impart the skills they need to get a job. Millions have used the comparable Federal Department of Education's College Scorecard. It helps parents make more informed choices about colleges by giving them better information about the cost of tuition and the value of education. Ricardo Hausman of Harvard University argues that one of the most effective ways to accelerate innovation and learning in, si in this system is to do what he calls move the brains around. Government can do this by creating new roles, such as chief data scientist, chief technology officer, or chief innovation officer, that involve the use of design and marketing skills, human-centered, user experience, or, inter or interaction designers, and so on. These roles, which might be short-term fellowships or advisory positions or full-time jobs, create the opportunity to bring new talent into an organization. For example, Mexico and the United States have both launched a presidential innovation fellowship at the national level to encourage the best and brightest, especially those with computer science, design, and other skills less likely to be found inside government, to serve in the public sector for a year. Because a sit-in government can be time-limited, 
this short-term appointee has a greater sense of urgency sometimes to not waste the opportunity. Of course, New Jersey has also created a new role called that of the Chief Innovation Officer, and our digital team is hiring designers, programmers, and data scientists. As we discussed in Module 8, prize-back challenges are increasingly popular strategies for promoting innovative solutions. For example, on challenge.gov, federal agencies in the United States have posted over a thousand competitions, from inviting the public to design a next-generation combat suit to asking it to devise a strategy for removing salt from salt water to improve agricultural yields. Prize-back challenges are suitable when the desired result, such as saving money or getting children to learn more quickly how to read, is agreed upon. In these cases, solutions submitted in a competition can be measured and compared. Economists Michael Kramer and Rachel Glenister articulate a case for advanced market commitments, or what they call pull markets, that guarantee a level of sales to innovators if they invest in R&D that leads to effective solutions. This idea draws upon the insight that the size of an eventual market dictates the level of effort inventors will invest in innovating. Pull markets have helped to produce vaccines and cures to otherwise neglected diseases such as Huntington's, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and muscular dystrophy, which affect fewer than 200,000 Americans each year. These conditions are so rare that the cost of finding treatments would be too high without government assistance. The U.S. Orphan Drug Act offered pharmaceutical companies seven years of guaranteed market exclusivity when the FDA will not approve another drug to treat that rare disease creating thereby an incentive to develop such drugs. More than 200 orphan drugs have been developed since the act was passed in 1983, while fewer than 10 were introduced in the decade before that. A key benefit of well-designed pull programs is that innovators get paid only for success. Professors Attila Abdul Kadiroglu, Parag Patak, and Alvin E. Roth, all experts in game theory and market design, developed a matching algorithm for assigning student applications to scarce seats in public high schools in New York. In 2004, the first year of the new matching program, the number of students who went unmatched to a school dropped from 31,000 to about 3,000. Roth has also expanded this work on matching markets to find donors for those needing kidney transplants. In Module 6, we discuss the collection or use of open data as another tool in our toolkit. Open data can Im help improve government accountability, improve service delivery, or enable citizens to make informed choices with the benefit of more information. Institutions also collect personally identifiable administrative data and use those to better understand a problem or deliver a more personalized service or solution. For example, many healthcare and education organizations endeavor to use data about a person in order to target an intervention. Data collaboratives, also known as public-private data partnerships, and data science talent exchanges are another tool now available since the evolution of big data and machine learning technologies. Today's public sector institutions frequently use insights from behavioral sciences to change human behavior. For example, a nudge is a behaviorally informed effort to adjust the delivery of a policy or service in order to change a individual behavior. Many examples demonstrate that changing how an agency notifies residents, for example, will make them more likely to comply with a mandate. For example, changing the default options for workplace pensions so that employees are automatically enrolled has been shown to increase participation rates and help people save. Sending a letter to people showing them how their energy use compares to that of their neighbors has helped reduce energy consumption in the United States by $700 million. New approaches to policymaking are also emerging from branches of behavioral sciences that deal with social judgment theory, heuristics, and biases, learning and judgment making in teams, and naturalistic decision making, among others. The Behavioral Insights team in the UK has codified these methods using four simple principles captured in the acronym EAST, make it easy, attractive, social, and timely. These are just some of the new strategies, the new tools in our toolkit that others have used for solving public problems. For more ideas, check out some of these helpful resources. Once you have searched for evidence of what works, we can now talk about in our mo next module how to implement your solution. Stay tuned.